You guys, we have made it. It's officially summer and summer is jam packed and the heat is no joke. So we have to be prioritizing our hydration. We ourselves are made of 60 to 70% water. So when we feel dehydrated, we are going to feel imbalanced. With all of the drinks that are out there, you want hydration that works. Liquid IV delivers extraordinary hydration with advanced science thanks to Liquid IV Hydroscience. It's an optimized ratio of electrolytes, vitamins, and nutrients. For me personally, you guys, Guys, I keep liquid IV on me at all times. It's in my purse, in my car, at my house to help me stay hydrated throughout the summer. Liquid IV pouches come in so many different flavors, so you are sure to find one that you like. They have sugar-free white peach, sugar-free green grape, which as you guys know, I've raved about it before. It is my personal favorite. They also have strawberry lemonade, lemon lime, and pear. Liquid IV has three times the electrolytes of the leading sports drink and eight vitamins and nutrients all in a single stick. With Liquid IV, there are no artificial sweeteners and zero sugar. You simply just tear, pour, and live more because one stick and 16 ounces of water hydrates you better than water alone. So turn your ordinary water into extraordinary hydration with Liquid IV. Get 20% off your first order of Liquid IV when you go to liquidiv.com and use code KILLER at checkout. That's 20% off your first order when you shop better hydration today using promo code KILLER at liquidiv.com. Hello everyone, what is up? Welcome back to another episode of Killer Instinct, you guys. Thank you so much for joining me here today. If you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I am your host of Killer Instinct. We post weekly here on the podcast every single Wednesday and you are not going to want to miss it. We also upload the video version onto YouTube on Wednesdays as well, so make sure you are subscribed. So you guys, today is the last episode of May, actually, which means it is the last episode of the Family Annihilator True Crime category of the month. As you know, if you've been listening thus far, we've been picking a new true crime category for every single month in 2024. I'm very curious to see what other types of categories you would like to hear, so make sure you leave it in the comments below. That way I can reference them when looking for new categories of the month. But today's case, as you can tell by the title, is one of pure tragedy. This truly is a heartbreaking case, and it might be a case that some of you are actually familiar with. It took place in 2018, and it was a very highly publicized case. And at first, this case was deemed a very tragic accident. However, after further investigation, it was clear that there was something much more sinister happening behind the scenes. As you can tell by the title, today we are talking about the heart family murders. So let's just jump right on into it today. So let's break down the Hart family. In the Hart family, you have wives Jennifer and Sarah Hart. Jennifer was born on June 4th, 1979, and Sarah was born on April 18th, 1979. Both women grew up in South Dakota. Jennifer was from a town called Huron, and Sarah was from Big Stone City. Jennifer was described as being a friendly person by those who knew her. Her friends said she always had a big smile. She was very outgoing. She was always the leader of the group. She was really passionate about the things that she cared about. She was very passionate about different political movements like BLM. She was very much considered an activist. She attended Huron High School before graduating and moving on to Northern State University, which is actually where Jennifer ultimately met Sarah, who was also attending NSU. Both Sarah and Jennifer majored in elementary education, and Sarah focused on special education. Sarah was definitely more of the quiet one out of the duo between Sarah and Jennifer. She was a little bit more shy, a little bit more reserved. She was described as being very go with the flow, and some described her as being a little bit more earthy. Jennifer and Sarah both had a lot in common. They both loved nature. They were very spiritual. They loved traveling. They loved adventure. And out of the two of them, Jennifer was definitely known to be more of the leader in their relationship. As I described with their personalities, Sarah was definitely more shy, timid, reserved, and Jennifer was more dominant. She was more outgoing. She was, again, known to be more of the leader out of the two of them. 
Now, when Sarah and Jennifer first began dating and first began their relationship, the two were being very secretive and they were hiding their relationship out of fear for how others were going to think. Again, we're looking at the time frame of the early to mid 2000s, so lesbian relationships were not always widely accepted, if accepted at all, especially in the Midwest where Jennifer and Sarah were living at the time. Now, Sarah and Jennifer were afraid of the public opinion that they would get once they decided to come out with their relationship. So again, they kept it very secretive and they told everyone who asked that the two of them were just roommates. Now, finally, when they did open up about their relationship because they did end up doing so, their fear came true because they ended up losing a lot of friends over this. However, they still continued their relationship and felt confident in the connection that the two of them shared. They didn't let public opinion or outsiders' opinions affect the connection that the two of them shared and the bond that they had. Now, after the two of them left NSU, they ended up moving to Alexandria, Minnesota in 2004, where they both worked at a Herberger store, which is a retail store. Now, with this move to Alexandria, this was a new chapter in their relationship, and they decided that they were not going to hide their relationship any further. They were not going to be secretive. They didn't want to have to hide the biggest part of their lives, which was their love for each other. So right from the very beginning, they came out to everyone who knew them, everyone who was working at the store, everyone who was friends with them, their families. Everyone knew that the two of them were a couple, and that is how they continued moving forward. And again, this was a very exciting time for them, and it was a refreshing time for them because it seemed like a new chapter that they were stepping into together confidently. Now, when it came to Jennifer and Sarah's future together, they knew that they wanted to get married and they knew that they wanted to have kids. Having children was something that was very important to them. Both of them had come from somewhat larger families. They came from two to three sibling households and they were both the eldest out of their siblings. And so they wanted to have kids. They wanted their kids to have siblings. That is the type of household that they wanted to raise. And so because of that, they turned to adoption in order to achieve those goals. Now, prior to adopting their children, they did end up fostering a 15-year-old girl in 2006, but it's not exactly clear what happened here. What we do know is they fostered this 15-year-old girl, and this was right before they received the first three out of their six children that they were adopting. However, when they took in this 15-year-old girl to foster her, only a week prior to receiving the first three out of their six children, Sarah and Jennifer took the 15-year-old girl to her therapy appointment one day and then never picked her up afterwards. It was actually the therapist that informed the 15-year-old girl that Sarah and Jennifer would not be coming back for her. And again, the details of this are vague. We're not exactly sure what happened in this instance. However, we do know that they fostered the 15-year-old girl and then one day she got dropped off at therapy and never picked up again. Now, a week after this, a week after dropping off the 15-year-old girl is when Sarah and Jennifer received the first first three out of six children that they were adopting. Now, again, this was in 2006, and the first three children that Sarah and Jennifer adopted were eight-year-old Marcus, four-year-old Hannah Jean, and three-year-old Abigail. They were placed with Sarah and Jennifer on March 4th, 2006, and then officially became adopted by them in September of that same year. Now, two years after this, in June 2008, Sarah and Jennifer took in again three more children from Houston, Texas. That was six-year-old Devante, four-year-old Jeremiah, and three-year-old Sierra. And these three were siblings. So now the hearts were a family of eight. You had Sarah and Jennifer and the six children. And one year after adopting Devante, Jeremiah, and Sierra, Sarah and Jennifer decided that they were going to get married, which they finally did in 2009 in Connecticut because at the time that was one of the only states that allowed same-sex marriage. So that is why they went to Connecticut to do that. Now I want to talk about the children for a second because all of these children 
and all six of them were said to have been the most joyful, full of life children there were. And I want to specifically talk about Devante for a moment because many of you might have actually seen Devante before without ever knowing it. In the year 2014, Devante was 12 years old and there was a picture of him that went completely viral. It was a picture of him hugging a police officer at a protest in Portland, Oregon. Now, this protest was a result of police brutality. And when I say that this picture went viral, I mean that it went absolutely completely viral. If you're watching me on YouTube right now, then you see the picture popped up. And many of you have probably seen this picture before because it has been referenced as the hug felt around the world. In the picture, you see Devante hugging the police officer with tears streaming down his face. Now, according to friends of the Hart family and just people in the public, a lot of people who saw this picture felt like it brought a lot of positivity into the world. It brought a lot of light. It brought a lot of hope in what was a very dark and scary time in the world. However, with that positivity, as you can imagine, with a picture like this being so public, it also brought on a lot of negativity and a lot of criticism, and the Hart family in particular received a lot of backlash. And Jennifer was really the brunt of that backlash because people would find her on Facebook, they would find her social media, and they basically harassed her because of this picture. They would send her mean comments comments, negative comments, negative comments about her children. And it was said that the backlash that this picture caused really sent Jennifer into somewhat of a depression. Jennifer lived a lot of her life on social media through Facebook and other social media outlets like Instagram. She was constantly posting. She was constantly giving updates on her kids, constantly posting pictures. And there were a lot of people who felt like Jennifer and Sarah were simply using their children children as props. A lot of people thought that Jennifer and Sarah just loved the attention that they were getting more than anything else, the attention and praise that they got for adopting six children because Jennifer was always, like I said, very quick to go to the internet and talk about every single aspect of their children's lives. It was said that she talked in great detail about her children's lives in the past and in the present, and some say that there were posts that were made by Jennifer that seems like she had somewhat of a superiority complex over having had adopted her children. She would say things like, if not us, then who? Or, quote, if it wasn't for us, these kids would have ended up who knows where, end quote. Some of the things that she posted just really rubbed people the wrong way because it seemed like all Jennifer cared about was being the hero in her own story. It, again, seemed like she wanted praise for bringing these kids in and adopting these children. She was posting posting all of these pictures of them, details about their personal and private lives. Now, I do want to fast forward to where we are now in society because there are a lot more restrictions about, you know, protecting children's privacy and not exploiting your children on the internet. But even back then, when that wasn't as prevalent, people still noticed how much Jennifer in particular pushed her children on the internet. Now, it's interesting because it was mainly Jennifer that was doing these things. Sarah was never really posting about anything. She was not as active as Jennifer was on social media and on Facebook. So Jennifer really was the one, again, who was pushing this narrative of the perfect family. And regardless of the front that Jennifer and Sarah were trying to put on about their perfect family, what was really happening behind closed doors was far more sinister than they wanted people to believe. Jennifer and Sarah had many many, many allegations, accusations, and a lot of evidence that pointed to child abuse and neglect to all six children. And again, I just want to take a moment to emphasize that everyone who always saw the Hart children, all six of these children, everyone always said how joyful they were, how nice they were. They were all super kind, polite, respectful kids who were just grateful for everything. They were always having fun together. They loved the sibling bond that they all had. To the outside, they seemed like your typical happy-go-lucky children. However, again, behind closed doors, 
things seemed very, very different. You guys, we have made it. It's officially summer and summer is jam packed and the heat is no joke. So we have to be prioritizing our hydration. We ourselves are made of 60 to 70% water. So when we feel dehydrated, we are going to feel imbalanced. With all of the drinks that are out there, you want hydration that works. Liquid IV delivers extraordinary hydration with advanced science thanks to Liquid IV Hydroscience. It's an optimized ratio of electrolytes, vitamins, and nutrients. For me personally, you guys, I keep Liquid IV on me at all times. It's in my purse, in my car, at my house to help me stay hydrated throughout the summer. Liquid IV pouches come in so many different flavors, so you are sure to find one that you like. They have sugar-free white peach, sugar-free green grape, which as you guys know, I've raved about it before. It is my personal favorite. They also have strawberry lemonade, lemon lime, and pear. Liquid IV has three times the electrolytes of the leading sports drink and eight vitamins and nutrients all in a single stick. With Liquid IV, there are no artificial sweeteners and zero sugar. You simply just tear, pour, and live more because one stick and 16 ounces of water hydrates you better than water alone. So turn your ordinary water into extraordinary hydration with Liquid IV. Get 20% off your first order of Liquid IV when you go to liquidiv.com and use code KILLER at checkout. That's 20% off your first order when you shop better hydration today using promo code KILLER at liquidiv.com. In 2008, the family was living in Minnesota, and there was a school teacher who noticed bruises on Hannah, Jennifer and Sarah's daughter. Now, when asked about it, Hannah told the teacher that Sarah had hit her with a belt. Now, Sarah and Jennifer were approached with this. However, they just brushed it off. CPS wasn't called for this specific incident, but Sarah and Jennifer did respond by pulling all six of their children out of the public school system so that they could homeschool them for a year before sending them back to public school. Then on November 15th, 2010, the Hart's other daughter, Abigail, went to school at Woodland Elementary School where the teacher had noticed that she also had bruises. Abigail had what she called an owie on her stomach and on her back. When the teacher asked if she could see it, Abigail lifted her shirt and showed the bruises. And when asked what had happened, Abigail said, quote unquote, mom hit me. Now, police and CPS were called for this specific incident. The teachers did call this in and police and the social workers arrived at the school later that day to conduct an interview with Abigail. Now, Abigail again repeated that her mom had been physical with her the previous day because her mom had thought that she had stolen a penny. That was apparently the cause of her receiving this punishment. Now, after the interview with Abigail, Jennifer and Sarah were called by police and instructed to come down to the police department to be interviewed separately. Now, Sarah immediately upon arrival took blame and responsibility for the marks on Abigail. She said that the day before she did spank Abigail and she did mention that her and Jennifer don't normally resort to physical punishment and to spanking. However, she did admit that she was having to do this more frequently because Abigail's behavior was out of line. Now, Sarah said that she did bring Abigail into the bathroom and bent her over the bathtub to spank her, which could be the reason that she had the bruises on her stomach. Now, Jennifer confirmed that it was Sarah the previous day who had spanked Abigail and that she was aware of this. Now, Sarah was charged and she pled guilty to assault and was sentenced to community service for a year. Now, one year after this, in 2011, Hannah, the other daughter, went to the school nurse and told her that she had not eaten all day. She said that her parents were restricting food from her. Now, the nurse did end up calling Jennifer and Sarah to see if this was true. However, both Jennifer and Sarah said that Hannah was quote unquote playing the food card and told the nurse to just give Hannah some water, not to give her any food or meals. Now, it was later in the year in 2011 that the kids were again taken out of public school to be homeschooled from then on out. So from that point on, the children did not go back into the public school system. They were continuously homeschooled from that 
point. Now, the children not eating is going to be a pattern that you see throughout the rest of this case. It was definitely a punishment and a tactic that Sarah and Jennifer used towards their kids. And punishment really isn't the right word. The right word is abuse. It was a tactic of abuse and a method of abuse that Sarah and Jennifer were using on their children. They would not feed them. So that is definitely a pattern that you're going to see throughout the rest of this case. Now, shortly after Jennifer and Sarah pulled their kids out of public school, they ended up moving to Oregon. And when they did this, well, every time you move or every time that you remove your children from the public school system, you have to report that you were homeschooling your children. You have to report to the school district that that is your method of education for your child. However, when the Hearts moved to Oregon, Sarah and Jennifer did not inform the school district that that was how their children were getting their education. So because of of this the authorities were contacted and whoever contacted the authorities about this it was someone who was close to Jennifer and Sarah however the identities of these people have always remained anonymous they reached out to authorities and to CPS to say that the kids were not being properly homeschooled but along with that they detected and believed that there was abuse going on in the household they claimed that the children seemed to be scared to death of Sarah and Jennifer they claimed that Sarah and Jennifer ran a very militant style household. And specifically, they used the term that the household was quote unquote regimented like a boot camp. Now, because of these accusations, interviews of the children were conducted by the police. However, when speaking to each of the six children, none of them pointed to any sign of abuse. They never admitted to anything. They never admitted that Jennifer and Sarah were abusive, and they didn't bring anything up that would strike police as a red flag in regards to child abuse. They were made aware of the previous accusations and charges against Sarah when it came to the previous child neglect and abuse. However, again, in this specific instance, they didn't see anything that pointed to any consistent abuse and the children weren't really speaking of any. And along with that, they did also speak to Sarah and Jennifer and Sarah and Jennifer both claimed that the accusations against them were completely and utterly fabricated. They claimed that the accusations were a cause of other people not being tolerant of two moms adopting six after African-American children. That was something that they constantly said, Sarah and Jennifer, and they were very vocal about it. They felt like they were almost a victim of people always belittling them and claiming that they had ulterior motives for adopting all of the children that they did. But in the end, like I said, the investigation did not have enough evidence to conclude whether or not Jennifer and Sarah were in fact guilty of child abuse. So the case was closed. Now in 2017, the year before before the murders, the Hearts moved a third time, and this time they moved to the state of Washington. And it only took a few months of being in Washington for the Hart children to start reaching out and asking for help and protection against Jennifer and Sarah. There was an instance in 2017 when Hannah ran over to her neighbor's home. Now, the neighbors that lived in this house were a married couple named Dana and Bruce, and on the specific night at approximately two in the morning, Hannah ran over to Dana and Bruce's home and began banging on the door. Now, it was Dana's husband, Bruce, who opened the door for Hannah at the time and immediately saw that Hannah was completely disheveled. She looked like she was a mess. She had twigs and leaves and just different brush on her from running through the bushes. And Bruce called out for Dana, who immediately ran downstairs to see what was going on. Now, according to Dana, she claimed that Hannah continually pleaded and begged for her and Bruce not to tell her moms where she was. She kept saying that she was afraid of Jennifer and Sarah and that she was being abused by them as well. Hannah said that in order to get over to Dana and Bruce's home, she had to jump out of her second story bedroom. She jumped out of the second story bedroom window just to run to get to safety. That is how desperate Hannah was at the time to not only get 
get out of this house and get out of the situation that she was in, but to hopefully and ultimately get help for her and her other siblings. Now, it did not take long after Hannah arrived to Dana and Bruce's home that Dana and Bruce looked out the window and could see that Sarah, Jennifer, and the rest of the five children were out in the streets looking for Hannah. They were calling for her name. They had flashlights. They were looking everywhere. And when Hannah saw this, she immediately ran up into Dana and Bruce's bedroom where she was hiding. Once this happened, Dana and Bruce split up. Dana went to go sit with Hannah in their bedroom and Bruce went out to see Jennifer and Sarah and to tell them that Hannah was at their home. Now, immediately when this happened, Jennifer and Sarah barged in to Dana and Bruce's home really without question. They didn't ask what was going on. They just ran past Bruce and marched right into the home and right up into the bedroom where Dana and Hannah were. Now, Dana says that when this happened, Jennifer and Sarah really bombarded Hannah and you could tell that Hannah was struck with fear. She was cowering on the ground between the bed and the dresser and because Dana could see how much fear was in Hannah's eyes, she really stood in between Hannah and Jennifer and Sarah and told Jennifer and Sarah that they needed to back up because clearly Hannah was in distress and she was terrified. Now immediately when this happened, Dana said that Jennifer and Sarah composed themselves and Jennifer told Sarah to take the other children back to their home and Jennifer would stay and deal with Hannah. Now Sarah agreed to do this and exited the home and that left Dana, Jennifer, and Hannah in the bedroom. Now after Sarah left, Dana said that Jennifer crouched down to Hannah's level and really told her that everything was okay and she was just worried about Hannah and that they were scared about what had happened to her because they didn't know where she went and that it's okay if she ever wants to leave, but she just needs to let someone know where she's going. It was clear that Jennifer was really trying to just put on a front because she had Dana's eyes watching her. Now, Dana said that whenever Hannah responded to Jennifer during this, it was always, yes, ma'am. She continually said, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. And Dana also described it as being somewhat robotic, which is not the first time someone has accused the children of being in a robotic state when speaking to Jennifer and Sarah. As we talked about previously in previous accusations, it was said that the children were very robotic in their answers. It seemed like they were so scared of Jennifer and Sarah that they just had these automatic answers that were instilled in them of yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. Now, after this happened, Jennifer did end up taking Hannah back to the home. And the following morning, Hannah had left a note on Dana and Bruce's doorstep. Now, this note was basically an apology letter from Hannah to Dana and Bruce. In the letter, Hannah wrote, quote, I was very frustrated with my brother and didn't handle my feelings maturely. I'm sorry for telling lies to get attention. I'm working on being more honest and finding better ways to communicate my frustrations. I've been pretty sad about two of our cats dying recently. Thank you for being kind from Hannah end quote. Now, initially, Dana really didn't know what to make of this interaction. This was really the first time that she had met Jennifer, Sarah, and the children. She had not spent a lot of time with them before. So again, she didn't really know what to make of this. And she felt like Jennifer was convincing. She has said since this that Jennifer was very convincing, that this was all just a big misunderstanding. And so Dana did not call CPS. However, Dana did tell her father. Steve about the incident, and he called CPS two months later. Now, after this, CPS called Dana back, and Dana did explain the incident again to CPS, and she also told CPS that she was worried about the children because she never saw them outside of the home, and that is when Dana said CPS told her, quote-unquote, it's not illegal to keep kids inside. It really didn't seem like CPS was too concerned at this very moment, but that wasn't the only time that Dana and Bruce had dealt with something like this, or that wouldn't be the only time that Dana and Bruce would deal with this, because shortly after this, Devante would start coming over to Dana and Bruce's home asking for food. This had begun in March of 2018. Devante came over to the house and asked for tortillas, 
ideas. Then the following day, he came over and asked for bread. And these visits started from one time a day, but then made their way up to three times a day. Every single meal, Devante would find his way back to Dana and Bruce's home asking for food. He specifically said non perishables. And when Dana heard that, she realized that she needed to really figure out what was going on here. She gave Devante everything he wanted, everything he asked for in hopes of building a sense of trust with him. She wanted Devante to feel like he could confide in her and what was happening. Now, after the first few times of giving Devante food, Dana asked Devante what was going on and what was this food for? And when Devante was asked this, Dana claimed that Devante said, that him and his siblings were being abused by their mom. He claimed that their mom would withhold food from them. And at first, the punishment started by being withheld just a meal here or there. However, now it had gotten to the point where the kids were being punished by being withheld from food for multiple days at a time. Dana said that Devante told him that, you know, they're in their teenage years and sometimes they behave poorly and so they get punished because of that and that punishment includes food being taken away from them for days at a time. Now when Devante was telling Dana this, he said it in a way that made Dana believe that Devante thought that this was normal. He felt like this was a normal sense of punishment. He felt like he almost deserved to have the punishment because of the poor behavior that he was exhibiting. And it was really at this point that Dana knew that she needed to do something and she needed to do something fast. And not only was Devante telling her all of this, but Devante also confirmed that the night that Hannah ran over to Dana and Bruce's home, Hannah was completely 100% telling the truth. He claimed that Hannah and the rest of his siblings were being abused by their mom. Now, when Devante was talking, Dana said that he kept using the word mom. It was wasn't moms, it wasn't plural, it was mom singular. And so because of this, Dana asked, what do you mean when you say mom? You have two moms. Are you talking about both of them? And Devante answered by saying that Jennifer was mom and that Sarah was Sarah. The kids called Sarah, Sarah, and the kids called Jennifer mom. So whenever he was talking about how his mom was abusing him, he was referring to Jennifer. He was not referring to Sarah. However, he did say that Sarah was complete sit in it. Now, there's something else that I want to talk about when it comes to Dana and the hearts. And that was the fact that Dana was told that Hannah was 12 years old. And even with hearing that she was 12, Dana was concerned because she claimed that Hannah was a lot smaller for her age. And she also was missing the front row of her teeth. Now, when Dana was talking to Jennifer and Sarah about this, they claimed that Hannah had always been small for her age. And they claimed that the cause of the missing teeth was the fact that Hannah had gotten into a fight at school and she didn't want to get her teeth fixed. So that is why her front teeth were all missing. But it wasn't until everything unfolded that Dana learned that Hannah was not 12 years old and that in fact she was 16 years old. So Jennifer and Sarah had lied to Dana about Hannah's age. Now, after everything unfolded with Devante, after all of that had happened, Dana did call CPS on March 23rd, 2018, and a CPS worker did stop by the Hart home to do a welfare check that day. However, no one answered the door and the CPS worker left their card in the door. Now, what no one knew at that time that we learned later was that on that day, March 23rd, the Hart family all packed into their car and drove away, never to return back to their home in Washington. The following day on March 24th, Dana noticed that the Hart family car was gone, and on the early morning hours of the 24th at 2.43 a.m., Sarah texted her co-worker saying, quote, I am so sorry. I thought I would be able to go into work, but I am too sick to come in. I may actually need to go to the doctor, end quote. But little did anyone know, similarly to all 
all the other times, the Hart family, specifically Jennifer and Sarah, were just continuing their pattern of behavior. And if you haven't noticed by now, this pattern is that every single time CPS gets called, CPS gets involved, the police get involved, anytime there is any suspicion of abuse or allegations or accusations of abuse on Jennifer and Sarah, they pack up their belongings and they move to a new state to try and avoid it. It is their way of trying to dodge everything that is going on and run away from these accusations. That's exactly what they did when they left Minnesota. It's exactly what they did when they left Oregon. And now it is exactly what they did when they left Washington. And when they left Washington, they drove to California. Now they were all in their 2003 GMC Yukon XL. The car was seen in Newport, Oregon on March 24th, 2018. And then the following day on March 25th at 8.05 AM, Jennifer is seen in Fort Bragg, California at a Safeway store purchasing $20 worth of food. So now they are in California. Now, it is believed that the family spent the entire day on March 25th in the Mendocino, California area. And then the following morning on March 26th, 2018, a passerby had called authorities to report that there was a car lying upside down at the bottom of an 100 foot cliff. Now, police immediately arrived on the scene. They saw the vehicle and also saw the bodies. The car that was at the bottom of this cliff was the Hart's 2003 GMC Yukon XL, and the bodies that police immediately identified were Jennifer and Sarah, as well as Marcus, Jeremiah, and Abigail. Jennifer and Sarah were found inside of the car. However, Marcus, Jeremiah, and Abigail were all found outside of the car. Now, obviously, this still left three of the other children unaccounted for. The following day on the 27th, police launched a search and rescue team to look in the ocean to locate Hannah, Devante, and Sierra. Now, Hannah and Sierra were discovered two weeks later on April 8th, and Hannah's remains were positively identified in January of 2019. But with that all being said, Devante's remains were never recovered. However, he was still declared legally dead by a judge in April of 2019. Now, when this crash first took place, a lot of you might remember it because I know I do. And police came forward and they said that they did not believe that the crash was the result of a crime. They did not believe that the crash was intentional by any means, but more so they believed that this was a tragic, heartbreaking accident. On March 28th, two days after the crash, the Mendocino County Sheriff came forward and said, quote, we have no evidence and no reason to believe that this was an intentional act, end quote. However, once police started getting more into the investigation, their opinion began to change. In their investigation, police learned that while Jennifer was driving the car with Sarah in the passenger seat and the kids in the back seat, she had pulled off on Highway 1 onto a gravel turnout and stopped the car approximately 70 feet from the cliff. It is believed that she then accelerated the car to 90 miles per hour without ever touching the brakes because investigators found no skid marks left at the scene. After accelerating to 90 miles per hour, the car was then driven off the 100-foot cliff, plummeting into the rocks below, killing everyone inside of the vehicle. Now, on April 4th, 2018, just a little over a week after the crash, that same Mendocino County Sheriff came back to the public and said, quote, I'm to the point where I am no longer calling this an accident. I am calling it a crime end quote. Police were able to get access to the Hart family home as well as Sarah's cell phone. And when they went into her phone, they saw that in the hours leading up to the crash, Sarah was making some very odd Google searches. She was making searches like, quote, is death by drowning relatively painless? How long does it take to die of hypothermia while drowning in a car? What will happen when overdosing on Benadryl? And can 500 milligrams of Benadryl kill an 125 pound woman? End quote. She also searched for a no kill shelter near their home as the family did have two dogs 
drugs that they left behind at the house. Now, when it came to the death certificates, suicide was listed as the manner of death for both Jennifer and Sarah. However, homicide was listed as the manner of death for all six children. Once a toxicology report was completed, it was found that all six of the children and Sarah had an extreme amount of Benadryl in their system. Based on the amount of Benadryl that was found in the kids' system, it is more than likely that the children were either asleep or unconscious at the time of the accident. A toxicology report on Jennifer was also done, which showed that her blood alcohol level was over the legal limit. The legal limit is 0.8 and Jennifer's was 0.102, which police have said is approximately about five beers. It was also said that Sarah had taken 42 single units of Benadryl. Marcus took 19.2. Abigail would have had to have taken 14. And Jeremiah had taken 8.8 single doses of Benadryl. Now, a special inquest by the coroner had the jury decide whether or not the crash was intentional or accidental. So a coroner went to a jury and explained everything about the case front to back. And in 2019, the jurors unanimously found that both Jennifer and Sarah deliberately killed their family. And a big factor in this was the Google searches. The fact that Sarah was on her phone Googling about all of the ways that Benadryl can affect you or is hypothermia and drowning painful. Those all clearly showed that Jennifer and Sarah had a plan here. And so this now leads into talking about the potential motive because police believe that Sarah, Jennifer, and the kids all left the house in Washington without the solid plan. They felt like Sarah and Jennifer quickly and chaotically and frantically gathered up the kids and got them in the car and just started driving because they felt like CPS was again onto them for the third, fourth, however many at this point time. And again, they were just trying to run away from it. Like I mentioned earlier, as part of the investigation, the police went to the Hart home and saw that everything that the Hart family owned was still in the house. Pretty much all of their belongings were still there. Their toothbrushes, their toiletries, their clothes, their suitcases, everything was still there. Nothing indicated that they packed and had a plan of what was going on. If anything, it looked like they were only planning on being gone a short period of time and potentially coming back. We don't know. But what we do know is that most of their belongings still remained in the house. In their driveway, they also had these some cement rocks, like cement stones almost. And police took the state of those rocks as just another example and to further prove their point of how quickly Jennifer and Sarah tried to get out of their current situation and get out of their home. They felt like they just pressed the gas pedal and didn't care what was going on behind them and they just frantically started their drive. Now, when it came to the plan of driving off of the cliff, police do not believe that when they left the home, they had this plan. They actually don't believe that the plan was created until after Jennifer was seen at the Safeway store. It's believed that after that, Sarah and Jennifer began coming up with this plan because where the car was discovered off of the cliff, that was only about 25 miles away from where the Safeway store was. Now, forensic psychologists have also theorized that as far as motive goes, Sarah and Jennifer could have felt like the truth about who they were and what they were doing to their kids was catching up to them. They could have felt like their backs were up against a wall. They could have felt like they couldn't keep running from the truth anymore. They were moving around place to place trying to avoid getting caught. That could have become exhausting or they felt like the truth was ultimately going to be revealed and they would have rather had to die than face the truth of what was really going on and have other people kind of look behind the curtain of their life and see that they weren't this perfect family that was being painted. Now, they also believe, and by they, I mean, the psychologists, they believe that it could have also been Jennifer and Sarah could have also had the mentality of if we can't have our kids, then no one can have our kids. They would have rather 
killed everyone in their family than have the option of anyone else, the foster system or any other person coming in and adopting their children. And again, we see this type of mentality a lot when we talk about more domestic cases between husbands, wives, boyfriends, girlfriends, all of the things. But again, this is a very clear example of it or a potential clear example of it as well. Now, as we sit here today. This is years later, years after this horrific event. There are still so many questions that people have in regards to this case. How much of a role did Sarah play in this case? Jennifer was known to be more of the dominant in the relationship. So was this something that was Jennifer's idea? Was it something that she came up with herself that Sarah complied with? Or did Sarah come up with it and Jennifer went along? What was the real motive of why they did what they did? Everything that's happened in this case is absolutely absolutely tragic and horrible. And I think one of the worst parts about it is that Devante's remains were never recovered. Police fully believe that he was in the car when the crash occurred. However, they believe that his remains were swiped out into sea before they ever had the chance to recover him. Now, a lot of Sarah and Jennifer's friends, when they learned about the crash, they quickly came to Sarah and Jennifer's defense, which led to a lot of public backlash. Since this case was so highly publicized in the media many of the people that were involved in this case not even the friends that were defending you know sarah and jennifer but the other people who did try and step in and help dana and bruce the neighbors they were highly criticized a lot of the cps workers were highly criticized the police were highly criticized for not doing enough and i think that that's the big frustration when looking at this case is it just feels like there were so many times that these kids could have been saved and they weren't They were continuously put back into a traumatic and abusive situation and cycle, which ultimately led to the death of everyone in the family. And it's just, again, so tragic and heartbreaking to see all of it unfold the way that it did, knowing that there was a lot of opportunity for someone to step in and put a stop to all of this. However, I think we also have to take into account how much of a facade was put up by Sarah and Jennifer. They portrayed themselves to be these heroes who adopted these less fortunate children. And instead, what they were doing to them behind closed doors, allegedly, was worse than anything that most people can ever imagine and worse than any child should ever have to endure, ever. And I think that's what's really sickening about this case is it almost seems like these children were used as some sort of, again, prop or ploy to make Jennifer and Sarah feel better about themselves, to make them, you know, look better out in society, to make it seem like they're the heroes in the situation. And it's really just sickening when you think about it that way. So I'll leave you with that. And I'm very interested to hear what you guys have to say about this case. But again, with that being said, you guys, that is all for me today. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Killer Instinct. If you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I am your host of Killer Instinct. If you haven't already, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. We post weekly here on the podcast every single Wednesday. You're not going to want to miss it. I'll be back next week with a brand new one for you guys. And until then, stay safe. Bye, guys.